um, as Franklin alluded to, I came up in the music industry and you had to have a record deal and put out a record. iTunes completely destroyed that and even before that Napster redefined the landscape. So it's happening quicker and quicker and the people who respond the quickest are the younger audiences. So that kind of axis shift where young people are determining the way things are developing technology-wise is quite exciting and they'll be building apps and all kinds of exciting stuff. So it's, um, it is a new landscape, definitely. Um, I, I'm super excited about the, the crossover between art, science and technology. So I'm really excited about this. I have a project coming up which I cannot talk about, my lips are sealed, but I'm working with a geneticist. That's all I can tell you about it so far. But in the future, I'm, I'm really looking at how to bring these together, which is why I'm really excited by what um, Ching, is that right? Is doing, um, because I really think that the future is experiential um, and technology plays a big part on that. In terms of a story, I got one for you, right? Because my work has featured quite widely on the press, BBC One, um, ITV, Reuters, The Guardian, you know, all the major kind of British channels and, and definitely, but how it featured on the US channels was like a social media story. So basically, I was shooting for the NYC Vale series and I was in, um, I was in bed time with my two friends, uh, Nyla, who's the girl with the, the nose chain that you saw and the leopard print, um, Nyla and Mirage. And we were, we were out shooting and suddenly this guy, uh, he stops and he's like, damn, you know, you know I w and he's a photographer, it's clear he's a photographer even though he hasn't got his camera with him. And he's like, it was, it's that moment where he wished he had taken that picture kind of thing, right? <laughs> so he was like, started talking to me and he was like, listen, I, you know, I lived out around the corner. If you allow me to take a photograph of these subjects, you know, um, uh, you know, I will you know, I'll, I'll post you on my, my social media, <laughs> right? And I was like, okay, you know, white guy, photographer. I was a bit skeptical, but it turned out, you know, because the whole exploitation thing and everything. So I was a, kind of a bit skeptical, but his spirit and his energy was so good. Uh, and he went back and he came back and he took the picture. Not the same picture that I took. Then he took a picture of us three all together. And then he posted it on his Facebook, which is none other than Humans of New York, which oh, you yeah. may have heard of. So that was Humans of New York, that was Brandon Stanton. Yes. So Elle magazine ended up doing a piece, uh, Huffington Post ended up doing a piece, Brazil's largest newspaper ended up doing a piece, and a whole host of other press just based off the back of the fact that Humans of New York uh, posted, which he said he never links back to people's pages. So he, he did that. So there's a nice social media story Sorry, for you. Um, no, that's really good. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And, I, and, I, and that is the power of social media. I mean, for me, a, a shift came when I, I kind of saw a lot of, um, I think it was like 2008, because I, I was anti-social media. I was... I was like, I had a, a company, I was doing well. Um, and then I kind of, everything that was, like, was real or physical in terms of work, I lost. I nearly went bankrupt. I nearly lost everything. And then I was like, how are people making money sitting at home in the digital <laughs> world? So that's kind of the, the shift that happened for me. And then I looked at like, Facebook and I looked at how social media works um, and how to engage and how the young people are using it. Um, and then I kind of just started a, started a business. I started my own social network called Fabs Network, which had, um, we had like 5,000 members. And it was basically like a creative network where people can like network with each other on, on it was like Facebook, but with a magazine where people can kind of communicate. Um, so I built that um, and then that got hacked <laughs> by the powers to be, you know, by Facebook. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, from there, people started c coming up to me like, and on like, via, via social network, at social media, saying, how did I do that? How, did, how do you tweet? You were tweeting a lot. And then it kind, of, it kind of stemmed from there. And then I became, I consulted on companies and done so many different things. But it was, it was basically the, the, the thing that kind of resonates with me is the, the, the speed of social media. Social media is, is the fastest information source in the world now. Yeah. 
you know, the news is, is they're just out of the picture. Like when something, when, for example, unfortunately, when um, Winnie Houston passed, it was reported 40 minutes, it was reported 40 minutes after social media had got it up. Does that make sense? So social media, the speed, and sometimes um, I think young people also have to understand that sometimes the speed or what they do on social media is, 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 is affected in a big way. So I try also to, to teach young people, just pull back a bit and, and, and not use it in, in a bad way. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Absolutely. And it's certainly a thing in terms of grief, in that idea where you can, not only can you respond immediately to grief, but then you can respond to the person responding immediately to grief. You can have these waves of response. And, and, and you know, the person... It is you know like it, that only happened 24 hours ago, and that is, yeah like that, that speed of that information is is, is 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 completely new, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. I think everyone said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> um, I think I completely agree that technology is evolving so fast, and now the information travels just throughout time and context that we can't really get track of it. And um, I think my, my interest always lies in how the relationship between art and science. Before, when I said I came from an architectural background, um, after architecture, I did a MA in um, art and science at Central St. Martins, where we sort of explored the relationship between art and science. And for me, um, art and science is not really, it, when you hear it, it, it sounds like two completely different two subjects. But if you studied it deeper, it's actually in interlinked in so many ways. And um, during the course, I sort of explored not only how um, we get inspirations from science knowledge or discoveries that we find from science, and we express them through art, and also how, um, how we sort of experience with art and how we practice art, and it sort of leads to discoveries or new methodologies of how we um, sort of investigate in science. So it's like an interchanging connection between the two subjects where I think is really interesting. And back to the subject of how I think information travels so fast, I think I complete, completely agree that it affects uh, modern um, social and Facebook and everything like that. It also, I think, for me, affects how information is transferred and sort of exchanged. Um, I think it also affects in advertising and brand experience design and feels like this be because um, um, before, if you think about that, your interest in maybe like a link or something, you'd have in the olden days, you'd have to get a piece of paper and a pen and write down www.whatever.com and now, that you can just generate a QR code and people, when they use their phones, they can just have a quick scan and it just automatically, one second, links you to whatever the link page. I think it's just like this thing of um, sharing information and this connection of data is just become so much convenient and faster in the 21st century. I think um, if we sort of um, be inspired or um, sort of learn, learn things from this and get it back into our arts. I think it pushes modern arts into a different dimension. That's why I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think really interesting like, predictions for the future there as well in terms of what comes next. There was a, was there a, a question over there. How, how are we going to do this? Uh, you shout. Yeah, I can repeat it as well. Hi, I'm Keisha. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm, I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, I'm interested in healthy living, positive energy, um, um, protecting animals, being at one with yourself. I'm interested in lots of different things, and I'm a hairstylist. Um, I want to have a good following on social media, but I find it hard to pick something. I'm thinking, do I throw all my interest on one page? Do I have six different Instagrams, how, how do I do it? Okay, um, where were you earlier? You should have come to my seminar. I'm uh, sorry. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, okay, so, well, I, what I was saying earlier is, is sometimes social media, especially what we, we do, is we try to put everything out there, which is, which, and then it gets lost, it gets, it gets completely lost. Um, I think you should focus on, this is just my, my opinion, 
is focus on what you're most passionate about. Yeah? Because, um, like, like I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm um, Europe's biggest sneaker blogger. I blog about sneakers. Um, so I have a page called King of Trainers, and I have a few followers. Um, and what, it's, there's a whole backstory behind it, but my main thing is I love sneakers, mm -hmm. you know. But then by building an audience, um, I can then not sell other things to them, but kind of give them my opinion on, on, on different things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my advice is really, is, is setting up one Instagram mm -hmm. page for what you're most passionate about. Build that audience and then you can start to drift other things in there once you've got the audience. Because what, what happens is if we try to do too many things, peop, you, people get lost. Okay. They start to be like, what, what, what's going on here or what's going on there? But once you have a, a large audience, you can chuck in certain things. I mean, I have an okay audience and I, I, I can chuck in, <laughs> I can chuck in an okay audience. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm being modest. It's, it's over, it's over 100,000 people. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know your, your movement and not you. Okay, so that, okay. That shows. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, but what I, what I do is I can then advertise. My main thing now is trying to advertise um, how young people can use social media and build their own blogs and how they can make, make money for themselves. Because I definitely think blogging is a vessel. It's like an out, outlet, you know that you can get out there and, and kind of let people know your thoughts and stuff. So I'm going to be doing a, a group of workshops surrounding that. But just, I recommend, just do one, one thing that you're most passionate about. And work on it. Yeah, and then be, be kind of just dedicate it to that. But also throw in different opinions in there when you build an audience. Because yeah. once you've got an audience, you can kind of keep them there. Does yeah, that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Yeah. And um, part two. Yeah. What's with all the hashtag stuff? See, I can't stand it, but does it help? <laughs> does it not help? Hashtag. <laughs> okay, so with hashtags, to be honest, I'll tell you where hashtags originated from. Yeah. Hashtagging is a lang is a coding language. Yeah. And when Twitter was invented many, many years ago, it was a way that the coders within Twitter can send information to each other. So they had to put a hashtag blah blah. They will say all these other things around it, but that's kind of where it started from. So when they built their search engine, like in Twitter, um, it was hard to find words in the beginning. So you hashtag them and it will become more potent in the search engine. Um, and that's kind of how the hashtag started. Mm -hmm. So when it came to um, the, the other social networks picking it up, like um, Facebook and, and Instagram and all that, it became like a trend, a trendy thing to do. So you have um, people just searching for hashtags. So when you do a hashtag, it could be music, it could be fashion. People are just there searching for different fashion inspirations. So use them. And then they, 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 they stumble across your page, etc. Okay. So it's just to enhance, enhance a word. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, all I kind of, uh, I felt the pain there of being told to specialize and focus on one thing. And I know, like, Fusion and I have had, like, tons of conversations about this, because how we actually met is through music, because I'm also a musician. I, I sing, I write songs, and I play. But I've had to specialize photography to be known as one thing first, right? And that has been to, to, to create something powerful. And now I feel a bit more like I can add things and people understand. I felt like when I was in Paris and in the United States, people got being a polymath or being really good at more than one thing. They understood it much more easily than they do over here. Um, but being based in the UK, I got a lot of stupidity, a lot of stupid people say, so what are you then? Because uh, last week I saw you perform and now, now you're exhibiting your work. What are you? Like, what, what do you want to do? And like, you know, it's, it's really annoying if you know that you're good at more, good at more than one thing and you have other, other interests. It's like really tough. But I think there are definitely benefits to focusing uh, on, on one thing, not, not at least externally, at least what you're showing to the world, first to kind of establish yourself and then 
uh, bringing the other things in. Because if you're dividing all your energy between all these different things and you're not putting energy into promoting one thing, confuses people, you know? A lot of people are, are simple and they, they just, they don't get it, you know? So, but I get it. I get it. I get it. I mean, just to, just to kind of build on that, when you talk about the simplicity of people, um, perhaps the argument is that the, the consumers consume and creatives who specialize in creating understand that you may be uh, engaging on a blog, you can write, you can market, you can do all these things. They appreciate the different layers. I think as an artist, it's just important not to uh, unknowingly contradict yourself. You know, if you have various skills, if you can layer those skills, then it's more exciting. If you sing and your content is purely about heartbreak and love and falling in love again, I'm wondering why you don't sing about health, why you don't have a diverse piece of content. So in a, way, in a weird way, you can include in your lyrical content aspects of your character. And then your video, you can have a go at styling yourself because that's an area that you're interested in. You don't shout about it. Let the style and the content shout for you. Push the singing thing. But I couldn't live in a world where I could just be just one thing. I would just melt away. So I believe in layering it, but one foot in front of the other, moving with purpose. Just to on top onto, onto that as well, just in terms of, I, I mean, I, I feel, because my background is in, in writing poetry, and like, that is the thing that I do. Like, I am a, I am a poet, and I, and I say that enough times, I believe it. Uh, but, the, the, but the advantage of when is, like, is this translation process of when I, as a poet, go to work for like a game design company, I'm coming into their offices as a poet. That's my identity. But it does mean that like, I've got this special, s separate kind of like, like role within them that, that, that they can't do. And so that's quite good for translating my skills to what they do and for, uh, and, and for getting collaborations between art forms going. But the reason why those you can collaborate in that way is because you know who you are and that doesn't mean you can't work with people who are, who are different. Um, so, okay, I, I got another question and it's, I, I, I feel this is quite like a, uh, a, a fiendish one, but like, I think it's useful because we're talking about um, uh, uh, failure. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, like, I'll, I'll, I'll save my question. I can ask you afterwards. Um, Thank you. Hi. Um, I actually have a question for you, Fusion. When you talked about uh, intergenerational work, I would like to know more about it because I think it's very important these days that we connect generation with each other. And so if you have more information about it, I'm very curious. Um, it's a beautiful question because um, when we think of youth, well, when I personally think of youth, when I sat in a classroom, it felt like um, Groundhog Day because every day I'm teaching 16 to 18 year olds and then they graduate and they go off to have these fantastic life where they have kids and work in places and they get another wave of 16 to 18 year olds. And this happened for like seven, eight years. I'm thinking, I'm the only one getting older. They're the, you know, I'm getting the same age group. But we all go out into the world and explore. And the, the sad thing is we live in a Western society where... Age isn't value. People are desperately trying to stay young, which is fine, but we are all going to get to a certain age in life. And I'm half Filipino, and what's great about the culture there is as you get older, you gain status. Your life experience that you've accrued has tremendous value. And I think it's exciting when we find ways of tapping back into those values because these are lost experiences and lost languages. One guy I know uh, I met through Inspiration has this idea of helping people with Alzheimer's. And the idea was very simple, um, table tennis, obviously. <laughs> um, by playing table tennis, you are able to stimulate parts of the brain that they wouldn't normally use. And in doing so, keeping their brains more active. And guess what? The helpers can help them play table tennis because they're active with them. And if you can keep that dialogue going, what could you learn from these people? It's, it's exciting. And it's an area I'm passionate about because we're all heading there. And I'd like to be 80, 90 years old and valued rather than shunt it away to some home where some you know, surveillance footage is showing me getting tumped up by someone. You know, I'd like to be active in the world and feel like my life was of some kind of value. So definitely like to talk. How you doing, guys? Um, 
Quick question. I know you're all creatives. Do you do this full time or do you balance it with other things like working part time somewhere else? And the question is, if you do, how do you balance it? And let's say you get a job in the creative field which clashes with your full time job. How do you balance that? And basically, how do you work, live in the real world, but do the creative thing at the same time? I want to know how you navigate that. Should I, should I start? Yes, yes. Um, I think coming from a personal experience, um, working in especially London as an art student is very, very hard. And I am a full-time student at um, Chelsea College of Arts. I'm currently doing MA in Interior and Spatial Design. And what I'm doing is um, coding of spaces. And currently, that I've successfully gotten a part-time job, which is at a local furniture company, where they quite like my ideas of embedding these codes into furnitures. So they have like this existing set of furnitures um, in like their little sets and I'm sort of designing with their main designer try to combine my idea um, of embedding these codes into furniture so like the, co um, the furnitures that they're gonna make now be able to scan by the mobile phone so it's quite like a interesting idea for them I think yeah I think you just have to keep trying you just have to keep trying until you get there and um, for me I think the best way to do it is know, have your passion, know what you really want to do, and try to find jobs, opportunities that closely matches your sort of passion. And so when you're working for other things you might not like doing, you still feel like, you know, it's part of the dream, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I just think you just have to keep on going for it, yeah. Y yes, to answer your question, I do do this full, full time. Um, I have... I'm a consultant on social media, so I consult for companies and I manage other companies' accounts, social media accounts. So in, in actual fact, I get paid to tweet, which is cool. <laughs> but um, what, what, I, what I really want people to understand is you can make money doing what you love. Don't let people make an illusion that you can't. You can make money doing what you love. You just have to put a price to it. Does that make any sense? You just have to... Eh? Eh. This, is what I'm so, this is what I'm talking about. Is you just have to put a price to it. Yeah? And you have to be determined to go out and get the jobs that you want to do. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Is, is basically, because I, I like tweeting and I like social media. After hating it, I start to love it. So I, companies, I'll go to companies, see their social media, say, look, I can do it for you better. This is how much I charge. And I've done that over and over and over and over again until people were like, okay, then I'll give you some money. And then I've done it well and I got more money. And it kind of went from there. Then I got invited and, and I got most of my clients through Twitter. But they saw my following and they were like, okay, we're going to get you to, to do ours. So don't let anyone tell you out of any creative thing you're doing, you can't make money. You just have to know what you can offer people, put a price to it and go, and go after the clients. Yeah? Okay. I would basically, uh, I'd second that completely. Like you said everything that I want to say. So yes, I do it full time as well. And it's exactly that. You have to be determined. It's not easy. I've had like part time jobs and so on. And it is hard to balance. But yeah, like when you're left with this ocean of having to manage, you completely manage your own time. It's, it's amazing. But it's, it is challenging but it's amazing at the same time so yeah everything he said basically yeah cosigns across the board I'd, I'd agree um i think living if you live here and you look at other people who are not in the creative field sometimes it's a more linear experience they get a job they work their way up they get a pay rise they work a bit more they get a pay rise and after a certain point they're living quite nice the creative industries doesn't necessarily work like that and it's a bit kind of scary when you've got to a certain point in your life and you're earning less than you earned five years ago, but you're more confident about who you are and thinking, what is my definition of success? And it does strip you bare. And after a while, you're thinking maybe success is being yourself and having the means to continue that journey. And it's kind of tempting when other people are driving a nice car or they've moved out of the neighborhood and you go to their house and the gates open. You're like, am I failing? Maybe, maybe not. You have to wrestle with those definitions and be true to yourself. 
and um, match courage with knowledge. Because some people say, I can do this. As Franklin said, when you go and write your blog and you can't cross your T's and dot your I's and your language is limited, you will not get paid. But if you have honed your craft by being an apprentice or working under some of the, the great leaders in the field, those dues will pay off. As for the crap job, I'm up for a bit of a crap job once in a while. I've done some terrible jobs in my life and I'm proud of the experiences they've given me because I can write a song about it or I can tell somebody who's struggling, I struggle too, but stick with me and we could fast track some of that struggle. But there are many ways to do it, but be true to yourself, I think.